Good morning to everybody and welcome to the plenary talk of today. It's my great pleasure to introduce Corinna Ucigrai. Corinna is Italian and she obtained her PhD in 2007 at, from Princeton with Sinai as her thesis advisor. She has worked at the University of Bristol and she is currently professor at the University of Zurich. And uh, she won several prizes, including the European Mathematical Society Prize in 2012, and the Wet Heat uh, Prize in 2013, and the Brim Prize in Dynamical System in 2020. And today she will uh, talk to us about uh, parabolic flows and slow cows. Thanks a lot. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> so uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers for the invitation and thank Carolina, thanks uh, Luna for the introduction. And um, yeah, too bad I cannot be there in person, but uh, uh, I'm actually currently organizing a summer school in dynamical system in Italy. So probably if it, been, if it had not been online, I could not be, have given this talk today. So there are advantages also about the uh, Zoom and the digital. <laughs> opportunities we have these days. So I will try to give a survey or overview to get a flavor of what is parabolic dynamics and specifically parabolic flows, which is in some sense uh, the leading theme in my own research interests. And uh, I'll start uh, slowly with a bit of introduction and motivation. So we're talking of chaotic systems, uh, but uh, systems which are fully deterministic. So completely described by equations. There is a clear deterministic evolution, no randomness. For example, could be solution of a differential equation, or we will see soon billiard systems. And it's very popularized and known that uh, they can display complicated chaotic behavior, deterministic chaos. And also very popularized is the butterfly effect that an image which was introduced uh, by Lawrence uh, to, to popularize sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So in a chaotic system, often if you change the initial condition, you have a very different long-term evolution. And uh, I uh, want to, I mean, I like to use the expression, it's not very, oh, there's not a formal mathematical definition, but I like to talk about uh, slow chaos versus fast chaos. And slow and fast refer to the speed in which the divergence in the butterfly effect happens. So fast, chaotic, the divergence is quick, slow, it's slow, and quick and slow means exponential. And uh, in the other hand, in slow, it's a super exponential. It could be polynomial or subpolynomial in some examples that we will see. And more formally, actually, as many people in Brazil are work and are experts in dynamical systems, and this is just a colloquial way to talk of hyperbolic dynamical systems, fast chaotic with uh, uh, positive entropy, and uh, parabolic uh, instead of what I call slowly chaotic. Just to analysts or other people, the parabolic, hyperbolic is used in a different uh, sense. So I think it's more good, good, gets a good idea to talk about slow chaos. And uh, again, um, the theory of hyperbolic systems starts from the 70s. And of course, there's active research on partially hyperbolic, non-uniformly hyperbolic. But in parabolic dynamics, I claim there is much less, uh, there's no general theory. So when somehow we understand well many examples, but it's hard to draw uniform conclusions. And uh, the team today will be to present a little bit what are these systems and uh, what do we know about them? Some examples of the research that is actually going on, which involves dynamical systems, a bit of analysis and geometry, also other tools. Okay, I'll start with a nice example, which is very simple, and maybe some many of you might have seen. It's the system of, uh, called the mathematical billiard, where you have just a, it's an abstract model of the billiard table. Say you have a planar billiard, it can be a little bounded domain. The standard table would be a rectangle, but you can be more. Uh, and um, you have a ball, which is frictionless, and uh, just a point with no mass, and the motion is along straight lines with bounces, elastic bounces with the same angle 
before and after hitting the wall. So this is an example of a deterministic system. And we want to look at the behavior of trajectories which don't hit the corners, in this case, the pockets. So they infinite motion. And just to give you a sense, if you put an obstacle in your billiard, in your square here, you can put a circular obstacle or a rectangular obstacle. Let's compare them. And actually the circular obstacle, it's a very famous billiard called Sinai Billiard. And Sinai was my PhD advisor as Luna maybe said that. And uh, these are um, fast chaotic billiards. And the key mechanism, geometric mechanism is the defocusing mechanism. So when you shoot parallel trajectories, you see that because of the concavity, uh, they scatter, they open up. So they start diverging and have a quickly a fast, uh, different future evolution. And indeed, Sinai was one of the first to, to prove hyperbolicity of this type of billiard. And on the other hand, if you have a flat boundary with corners, like a polygon, only the corners create um, in the terminus. It's only if you have trajectory, a ray of trajectory is split by hitting or not hitting a corner, then they have different future evolution. And this does create uh, sensitive dependence on initial conditions and does create chaotic features, but much slower. This is just an intuitive picture to keep in mind. And here I have a bit of a review of basic dynamical questions people may ask, just let's skip to the billiard because it's an easy example. You can ask whether there are periodic orbits. This is a billiard trajectory which closes up and the motion is periodic. Or you can ask if the trajectories are dense, so they, or they, they get arbitrarily close to every point. Or uh, this is a picture where you see a trajectory which is getting more and more dense. Or they could be trapped and have trapping regions. And if the trajectory is dense, you may want to ask if it is equidistributed. And I will define this in a second. Uh, intuitively, you want it to equidistribute. It means that it fills uniformly the space. And this is an example of not equidistributed trajectory. This is a billiard with a barrier. And you see that this trajectory seems to spend more time in certain strips than others. And formally, you can just take an observable. Sorry, OK, you take a function on your billiard table, and you integrate this function along the trajectory. And uh, if it's equidistributed, when you integrate the values that you are seeing by moving around, you will converge to the average of the function. So there is a way to mathematically define equidistribution. I'm being a bit vague. And um, an important message, I'm starting with people who do not work in dynamics, is that chaos is good. So the more chaotic you are, the better, because when your system has sensitive dependence, maybe you cannot predict a single orbit, but you can try to predict in average the asymptotic behavior of typical trajectories. And this is a key idea which goes back to Boltzmann and uh, the beginning of ergodic theory. So the more you are chaotic, uh, in some sense, the better you can predict in average long time, long term behavior. And here I want to introduce two more chaotic notions in this and in the next slide, ergodicity and mix. So ergodicity is a key notion in when you have an evolution, a flow, a transformation, which preserves the measure. And in this case, if there are no trapping regions, so if there are no invariant sets, no sets which stay into itself, uh, so no sets which are mapped to itself. Uh, maybe you can exclude measure zero sets uh, or full measure set. If there are no trapping regions, no invariant set, then you can prove, you say that the system is ergodic. And in this case, the typical trajectory will be uniformly distributed. So as we said before, uniformly distributed means that if I take a function and I average it as time goes on, I take the average of the values along the trajectory along the evolution, it will converge to the average with respect to the invariant measure. Okay. And the last property, which may be also quite intuitive, but important to, 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 I want to tell you about is mixing. This is a stronger property than ergodicity. So we saw just dense orbits, equidistribution and ergodicity, and mixing is about evolution of not a single point, but a set. So you take a set A, 
you can think of it as a cloud of initial conditions. And uh, if the system is mixing, when you flow it, so for lo after a long time, it will spread, mix. So this is a picture of a billiard in a diamond. And you see that, uh, do it again, you have a localized set and when you evolve it, it starts spreading uniformly. Okay. And again, this is about two observables. You can take two observables. You can take the indicatrix function of the initial part and some random part of space. And when you move, when you compose F with the evolution and integrate with respect to a G, you converge to the product of the measures, uh, the product of the integrals. Okay, don't, don't worry too much about the definitions if you're not familiar, but this idea, I hope it's clear of mixing. And then there's much more. There are many chaotic properties, weak mixing, mild mixing, multiple mixing, and there are uh, spectral properties. When you study the action on L2 functions of the dynamics. So you take an L2 function, you compose with the dynamics and you get an operator and you can study the spectrum of this operator. And this is spectral theory. Okay, this was a bit um, overview of what do I mean by chaotic properties? and which type of chaotic properties we will care about. And now let's go back. I want to give you two examples of slowly chaotic systems or so parabolic systems. So first of all, okay, billiards appear naturally in physics, in many parts of physics. I want to just uh, mention two examples of infinite billiards, which are studied in statistical mechanics. And this is the periodic Lorentz gas. And uh, okay, let me explain. Now the billiard is not in a bounded domain, but it's on the whole plane. And I place the gray circles are scatterers. So you place periodically, for example, uh, scatterers, and then you play billiard in the white part, you see outside. And the white part is your billiard table. And uh, this is a hyperbolic billiard, which is very much studied. And uh, I'll put some names of people who worked on it. But I want to compare it to another model, the Ehrenfest model, which is also an infinite planar periodic billiard, but now the scatterer is a rectangle. And it's kind of funny that historically, Paul and Tatiana Ehrenfest introduced this model a few years after Lawrence had suggested his billiard for studying, for example, yeah, thermodynamics. And you can think it could be atoms regularly spaced in a crystal and electrons motion, for example. Um, they suggested to consider rectangles thinking that they would be easier. And turns out that as we saw before, the circle uh, gives the fast chaotic system, the rectangle gives a slow chaotic system. And we understood uh, we are, only recently we started to understand uh, slow chaos better, and uh, indeed the results on the RFS model were only proven in the last maybe five years. And I put some names, and this is something I also worked on. And I just to mention a result, for example, uh, together with Chisto Fronchek, we proved that in RFS billiard, if you shoot in a almost every direction, if you shoot at random a billiard ball, actually the orbit will not be dense. And in general, uh, the billiard will not be ergodic, even though it's very hard to visualize. There's not a very easy trapping region, but it is not ergodic. This is something which was proven only recently, well, a few years ago now. But use it. why now, why later? Well, we'll see at the end because it uses renormalization tools which come from tech Muller dynamics and were developed only in the last, uh, actually, it also uses uh, Mir Zakani, uh, Eskin, Mohammad, very recently only we had the tools to treat him, to treat him. Okay, and then the second example of slowly chaotic system, which I also liked a lot because I worked a lot on it also, and it's a very basic dynamical system. And it's just flows on surfaces. So we have a surface and um, uh, some genus. It's a torus only here, and then it will become higher genus. And let's take just orientable surface and let's take a flow. So I just, uh, you can imagine some motion described by phi t after time t, I am a phi t of p. And uh, um, let me make sure of the motion of a point. And again, I want to look specifically at higher genus surfaces where the genus is at least two. 
And in this case, uh, you have to have fixed points. And the fixed points can be, uh, if the flaw is area preserving, for example, they can be centers or simple saddles or multi saddles. And uh, I will assume indeed that the flaw uh, is incompressible or that there is some area form, some, which is some, there is some notion of area on the surface, which is preserved, smooth area, which is preserved when you flow. So when you take a set and, and flow it, the area doesn't change. Okay, and again, why do we care? It's a fundamental two-dimensional dynamical system. I think it's one of the most basic examples in low dimension, but it also appears in physics. So flows on surfaces appear historically, it goes back to Poincaré and the very beginning of the study of dynamical systems. And from celestial mechanics, one can uh, reduce many problems to the study, for example, of flow on flows on tori or, or surfaces. And specifically this, uh, uh, smooth area preserving flows on higher genus surfaces appear when you study, for example, electrons in metals in solid state physics. So there is a model by Novikov in the 90s where you study an electron under a magnetic field. In, in, in the quasi classical model, you have some energy level surfaces and some reduction brings you to this um, locally Hamiltonian flows that are nothing else than smooth area preserving flows. Okay, just to say that they appear uh, and, and both this error model and this uh, smooth area preserving flows are examples of slow chaos as we will see soon. And again, uh, why they are slowly chaotic, for example, let me tell you what we know now about the chaotic properties of the systems. Uh, first of all, um, let's assume that they are minimal so that the orbits are dense, and it's a result of the 80s by Mazur and Beach that they are ergodic. So ergodic means, uh, again, that if I take uh, averages of a function along the trajectory, it converges to the average with respect to the area, the, the mean. And, but the convergence, it's actually quite slow. And it's what is called the polynomial. So, it's an idea. so, yeah. so basically the convergence to the average goes down like uh, one over t, constant over t to the alpha. So in this polynomial um, speed of convergence, it's a feature of slow chaos. So in a hyperbolic system, you often have uh, things converging exponentially fast. And uh, mixing is something that, uh, um, I myself worked a lot on, starting from when I was a PhD student through the years, and now we, and, and other people too, and now we understand essentially very well uh, when they are mixing. It's a little bit complicated to state because it depends on the type of singularities. And um, when there are uh, traps, that maybe in some cases they are mixing. And when they are mixing, actually, David Ravotti, was a PhD student of mine, proved that the mixing happens uh, super polynomially. So actually it's very slow. And again, all these slow chaotic features are part of the slow chaos paradigm. And again, and recently also we have results about the spectrum and okay, maybe in genus two it's singular. Okay, I will not uh, talk about this now. Okay, so now you have some examples, some motivation. So um, I want to say there are actually many other uh, mathematical examples of slowly chaotic or parabolic flows. So, oh, sorry, I think I missed the picture, sorry. Uh, okay, so this is the flow on the surface that we already had. Uh, and uh, to the left here, uh, another example, I will not define it, but if you know hyperbolic geometry, you may know geodesics and geodesic flow, or this is a picture in the upper half plane, you might have heard of the horror cycle flow. And the horror cycle flow, the geodesic flow, on a negatively curved surface is a hyperbolic flow, but the horror cycle flow is maybe the cl most classical example in mathematics of a parabolic flow. And the other, I don't want to define this flow, so if you don't know, don't worry, I'm just telling you some examples just to, because I will mention as a, compare them. But another example are nil flows. So you have a nil manifold, so it's a quotient of a nil potent group by a lattice. Uh, 
And uh, you can look at one parameter flows and those are called nil flows. And th those, are, those are also um, stolic we will see. And they, they, they seem to have these three examples, for example, have very different dynamical properties. Let's talk about mixing, for example. The horror cycle is always mixing. Deal flows are never mixing. And as most area preserving flows sometimes are, sometimes are not. As I said uh, before, it depends on the type of singularities. We understand it, but and you may wonder, okay, well, they are so different. Actually, there's some pseudo philosophy that we do when some of my co-authors, like Giovanni Forni, we decided to call them, to call the horror cycle uniformly parabolic and mm, the other two non-uniformly parabolic and partially parabolic. It's an analogy to what people do in hyperbolic dynamics. And there are reasons about that. If you want, you can ask me later. But uh, okay, maybe they are not the same type of parabolic, but they still have different properties. So how do we do <coughs> a theory of parabolic dynamics? Is parabolic dynamics a zoo? A zoo meaning that there are, it seems that there are many examples all with different properties. And uh, part of the uh, way that I like to think of a thread that has been going on, uh, that I've been following, but also other, uh, mathematicians have tried to do is to identify common features. And there are various lines of research in this direction. So one can try to identify common mechanisms, which explains the chaotic features of the systems, common tools, which help you to study uh, more of them, and also study perturbations, parabolic perturbations, and hope that maybe when you perturb, maybe one system failed to have some property, but maybe the perturbations have a typical properties. And in the rest of my talk, I would like to give you uh, examples of these three lines of research. So I will go a bit through all these three types, common mechanisms, common tools, and the perturbations. And uh, okay, so this is uh, shearing and rotten property. I want to explain now as common mechanisms. Uh, renormalization, I will say something at the end as a tool, and time changes as a specific example of perturbation that we understand quite well in some cases. Okay, so first of all, a very nice mechanism. Not, these mechanisms are not universal, so they're not every system, but they have been used in several uh, types of systems. and. Uh, and what, one feature of many systems is that the butterfly effect happens in a special way and through shearing. So in, I will show you now two examples, but you can see often this picture that you take two initial points which are nearby and the orbits of this point, the trajectories are parallel. So they go parallel to each other, but they have different speed. So one point go faster than the other on the trajectory. And if you see a picture like this and you take a transversal curve, when one point is faster than the other, the transversal will shear. Will, uh, will, the, the different deceleration will create uh, shearing. And uh, in this picture, you see that after a long time, a transversal direction will uh, bend and follow the direction of the trajectories. Let me show you how this happens. For example, this is a picture, a piece of an area preserving flow. And here you have a separate, a saddle connection. So you have a trajectory which goes from a saddle point back to itself. And this is what I call a trap. And if you have here a saddle, turns out that if the saddle is Hamiltonian, the it takes you infinite time to get to the fixed point. And if you go very close to the fixed point, you slow down a lot. And because you slow down more and more, the closer you get to the separatrix, so near a sudden trajectory slow down at different speed and you kind of see shearing appearing. So the point to the left, it kind of takes a long time to go out of the neighborhood of the saddle and to the right you go faster. So this is one mechanism for shearing. <clears throat> yeah. And the other example in the horocycle flow, and again, sorry, if you don't know what it is, don't worry. <clears throat> but a horocycle flow comes with, together with geodesic flow. And um, if you take a piece of geodesic, 
uh, geodesic in the upper half plane and you flow it by the horror cycle, what will happen is that the um, geodesic arc, transversal arc, will shear in the direction of the horror cycle. And this is a phenomenon if you, there is a commutation relation between geodesic and horror cycle, which explains uh, the shearing phenomenon. Okay, so I see uh, here are two examples where you have shearing. And oh, oh no, I forgot, I forgot one piece. Oh no, I'm sorry, I missed a slide. Okay, there is a missing slide, I'm sorry. Uh, so let me say, um, this shearing actually can help understanding mixing. So, and ah, maybe I can do something else. Ah, you can, can you see? No, you cannot see, yes. Uh, uh, no, can you see what I'm showing? No, uh, no. One second, but then I have to go. Uh, let me try to find the picture. Uh, no, if it takes me too long, it doesn't matter. Uh, no, okay, maybe it doesn't matter. One second, I give it one chance, and if not, it doesn't matter. No, okay, okay, let me go back, doesn't matter. I will just explain it in words. So if you have a, a system which is ergodic, so uh, long trajectories are equidistributed. And I think I do want my picture. Um, and it pass. Um, one second only. Uh, no, it doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, shearing. Mixing, yeah, shearing, no. No, okay, it doesn't matter. It's okay. Uh, uh, ah, I found it. So can, can you see this? picture a little bit smaller, view throughout. Can you see? No, okay, it doesn't matter, fine. Okay, so, um, okay, it doesn't matter. You can use a shearing to explain uh, mixing when you have ergodicity. Uh, so uh, if you take an arc and uh, okay, you use it to cover a set, you can cover a set with transversal arc. And when you flow your set, each arc will shear and become almost a long trajectory. But if long trajectories are equidistributed, also your set will get equidistributed through, um, yeah, you can kind of transfer, uh, you can upgrade ergodicity to mixing using shearing. Sorry that I lost the picture, doesn't matter. And um, you can ask if you can use uh, mix to do more than, uh, so you can use shearing to do more than only mixing. And it turns out that uh, uh, there's a, an example, a famous, famous work uh, in the homogeneous dynamics in the study of the horror cycle flow and more in general, uh, unipotent flows in homogeneous dynamics. And it's in the work of Marina Ratner. Uh, it's actually celebrated because it found lots of applications in different areas of mathematics. And uh, Marina Ratner proves uh, some rigidity theorems that I don't want to talk about, but I want to say that the key tool in her work is shearing indeed. And it's actually a quantitative form of shearing that nowadays we call the Ratner property. So, and the Ratner property is again, it's a quantitative form of shearing, which describes uh, this type of uh, uh, butterfly effect. And, uh, which is actually really typical of a slowly chaotic parabolic systems. And uh, her work is again, works for horror cycle flow, but it doesn't work for non-homogeneous, what are called non, all the other examples that we saw are not homogeneous. And uh, a question that was maybe raised by uh, mathematicians like uh, Tuveno or Lemanchik was if we can prove the Ratner property for other examples of uh, slowly chaotic systems, apart from uh, horror cycle flows or unipotent flows in the homogeneous world. And the good examples are indeed flows, uh, air smooth air preserving flows on surfaces. So the problem is that um, this, uh, um, our surface flows in higher genus from genus two on, they always have singularities like we saw. And when you have a singularity, it actually spoils uh, shearing. So imagine you have two points which are nicely, slowly shearing, but they are separated by 
a separatrix. By, they, they go on different sides of, uh, of, uh, of uh, a saddle. When, when this uh, uh, singularity um, breaks your uh, transversal arc or it separates the points, then you lose control of shearing. So you cannot prove this quantitative slow shearing that it's nice to use. And uh, nevertheless, um, recently, in joint work with uh, Adam Kanigowski and Joanna Kuaga, uh, we proved that um, flows on surfaces with traps, they actually have not the original Rattler property, but the variation of the Rattler property. So you can still recover some of the property. And this is a variation uh, by Fayad and Kanikovsky. It's called switchable Rattler property. And somehow the idea is that if your points are broken by a singularity, well, you can try to go backward instead than forward. So you can switch from the future to the past. And maybe in the future you hit a singularity, but if in the past you don't, well, for, for, if for many points, you can, well, there are quantifiers, but uh, if you can find a nice uh, Rathner type of shearing uh, backward, sometimes you can prove the same results, the same type of results. And uh, for example, we use this Rathner shearing to prove, uh, improve mixing to mixing of all orders. It's a stronger form of mixing where you don't control two functions, but you control multi-correlations, you control n functions and you evolve n functions under the flow. And also um, we used it to prove um, with kanigowski lemanchik there's a, another feature which I think it's very important in parabolic dynamics in this type of system is the, the property of these joint rescalings. So what are these joint, what are rescalings? You can rescale your flow simply by rescaling time. So you take time and you multiply it by a constant kappa. And having these joint rescalings, it's a property where if you have a non-trivial rescaling, so if you multiply by a constant different than one, you get a flow which is disjoint in the sense of Fustenberg. And that means in particular, non-isomorphic. And it's a strong form of non-isomorphic. So you get a very different flow. And this property that when you rescale your flow, you get something non-isomorphic. It's really special also, seems to be special of a parabolic dynamics. So it doesn't happen in the hyperbolic world. And again, also this work on this jointness is based on a criterion which exploits Rattner shearing, the, the, switch, the, the variation of the Rattner form of shearing. And again, this, both of these jointness of rescalings and uh, this uh, variant of the Rattan properties seem to appear in other examples of parabolic dynamics, like von Neumann flows, Heisenberg flows. There is a lot of work so trying to push this program. So this is, these are our examples of properties which are shearing and Rattan shearing seem to be important properties in parabolic dynamics. Okay. And I promise I will also say something about uh, perturbations and tools. So I have one slide about perturbations. And uh, again, um, I want to see what happens when I try to perturb a parabolic flow, but it's hard sometimes to get a new parabolic flow because it's kind of unstable, but a very easy perturbation which gives you a parabolic flow is simply a time change. So what is a time change? Uh, essentially, it's a just uh, you reparameterize the trajectories. So I, I don't know if I can. So here I have two identical pictures. So in one, you can move with a certain speed. And if I do a time change, I move on the same trajectory, but maybe slower or faster or slower. So it's just a reparameterization uh, of the velocity. It's a very simple perturbation because it doesn't change trajectories, but in the parabolic world, even time changes are often give you new flows, which are not isomorphic. They're really different than the original one. So even if it seems such a trivial perturbation, it gives you a genuinely new flow, which can have a very different chaotic property. So ergodicity doesn't change by mixing, with mixing, spectral properties are very sensitive to this operation of reparameterizing time. And the philosophy that 
we are trying to explore is whether sometimes you have uh, bad examples with few, with, with don't have typical properties, but when your time change, sometimes you, new fe common features emerge, so you get better properties. And I want to give you two examples in this slide. And one are time changes of lead flows, and one are time changes of horocyte flows. Here I put the definition of a lead flow. You have a nil potent lead group, and you take the quotient by a lattice, and you get a nil manifold. And then you look at uh, multiplication to the left by a one parameter subgroup. That's a nil flow. And uh, nil flows are never mixing. I said that some time ago, but if you time change any flow, actually they're never mixing because there is a, a torus, uh, there is a torus, uh, there is a toral factor. You can see, uh, okay, it doesn't matter, maybe for. Um, but if you time change, actually we proved various years ago with Arthur Avid and Giovanni Forni that uh, the special case of Heisenberg flows, you get, you can get mixing. And recently we proved it for general flows also with Ramotti. So, okay, so not mixing, it's a bad case because uh, nil flows are kind of too homogeneous, but when you perturb with a time change, you can produce mixing. And uh, another example about this joint terms of rescalings, we just saw a second ago, the, it's a, you rescale your flow and you say that you have this joint terms of rescaling if the non-trivial rescaling is disjoint. And uh, the whole cycle fails the disjointness of powers somehow, um, yeah, all powers are intertwined by the geodesic flow. But if you time change horocycle flows, we proved with Adam Kanigowski and Marius Lemanchik that uh, then you have this property of this jointness of rescalings. And this property has been used also in connection with uh, the Sarna conjecture, maybe sort of orthogonality conjecture in number theory. So as a corollary, we also have this uh, Sarna conjecture for time changes of horocycle flows. Okay, and a um, few words about the key tool. Again, um, it's a tool, with, okay, a tool which has been used to study a lot of these parabolic flows and that I like a lot is uh, renormalization. And the idea, of, and I will not say too much, I'll just give you the philosophy of renormalization. I think it's a beautiful idea. You want to study one system, you want to study one flow on a surface, and uh, instead of studying the flow by itself, you think of it as a point in the space of all dynamical systems of the same types. All of, of, you find the space of flows on surfaces. And uh, your system is just a point in this parameter space. And then you start uh, acting on the parameters. You try change your system through uh, to the renormalization dynamics. So you, there is a dynamical system on all dynamical systems that you want to study. And uh, you deform your system. And how do you choose this super dynamics? You choose it so that it acts as a zooming machine. It kind of looks at smaller and smaller parts of space and enlarges what is happening at fine scales. Very vague, vague idea, but somehow. So you want to study your system, you want to zoom at smaller and smaller scales, and the zooming happens by deforming your, your, the system you want to study. All right, and I'll give you two examples, but well, not in detail, but why would you do that? Actually, what is good is sometimes the renormalization, which is again a dynamical system, again an evolution, it's fast chaotic, often it's hyperbolic. And we understand the action on, on renormalization better. And sometimes you can use renormalization to get information on the system you want to study. And uh, in the case of this area preserving flows, uh, and, uh, sorry, for example, renormalizable systems are area preserving flows and also Heisenberg flows. And all these uh, theorems that I quoted before about mixing, about Ratner shearing, about um, also about the spec, they, they often depend, use a normalization dynamics. So you want to um, put conditions which guarantee mixing and shearing, and uh, these conditions are expressed in terms of the renormalization, and you want the renormalization to be recurrent. So you want, when you deform your system, 
you want to come back close to the initial system and maybe even in a quantitative way with some quantitative information. And in this case, the renormalization is given by the tight Muller geodesic flow. So it's a flow on the space of geometric structures on surfaces. Again, it's very vague, but I just want you to give you, I'll tell you the story without giving you the, the details. And another examples are Heisenberg mean flows. And Heisenberg mean flows are also renormalizable and uh, they have recurrent renormalization. So when you have renormalization and it's recurrent, it's a very powerful tool to understand your system. Unfortunately, not many uh, parabolic flows are renormalizable. For example, in general, the flows are not, but sometimes you can use even divergence of renormalization to study your system. So I'm getting close to the end, but I wanted to uh, tell you one last result so the, about some re very recent work that actually uses renormalization. Uh, and uh, um, it's a little bit different. It's about flows on surfaces, but I want to convince you that renormalization is useful also when it's uh, not recurrent. So this is, you can, it's independent. So you, if you got lost, you don't worry. So you can still recover the last two slides. And um, I want to tell you a recent work on the rigidity of uh, foliations on surfaces or trajectories of flows, you can think. And let me tell you a classical result, very classical result related to the theory of circle diffeomorphisms. So if I start in genus one, or the torus, and consider um, foliation. So foliation means uh, I decompose my space into trajectories or leaves, orientable foliation. Yeah. And a very basic example is the linear foliation. So if you take a square and look at irrational uh, lines, and you glue the square, you will get uh, foliation and the leaves, the, these uh, lines are actually dense when the angle is irrational. And it's a well-known result, one of the basic results in dynamical systems that, uh, okay, if you have this minimal foliation, it's linearizable. So you can actually find a change of coordinates, a homeomorphism, it's called the topological conjugacy, which straightens your leaves, so which maps the smooth leaves into the linear leaves. And uh, you can ask if uh, uh, this linearizable, you can, it's actually, you, if you can linearize uh, in a differentiable way. So you can find not only homeomorphism, but a diffeomorphism, a C1 change of coordinate, which uh, straightens your flow. And you say affiliation is geometrically rigid. If when it's linearizable, you can actually linearize it C1 differential. And I don't know if how many people, there are students who went to, I thought there was a um, course last uh, week on uh, circle diffeomorphism. Maybe you saw some of the classical theory. And turns out that uh, full measure set of foliations, I don't want to say in which sense, are geometrically rigid in genus one. And this is the reformulation of the celebrated work of Hermann and Hermann Yokoz on circle diffus. And um, this is the last slide. So recently we considered with Selim Guazwani uh, generalization to genus two. So now we take a surface of genus two and uh, orientable foliation, but this time you have to allow for singularities. So there are some saddles here, two simple, and we assume that the saddles are Morse. So they are level set of a Morse function. So that's, that's the picture of the saddle. And um, so with Selim Ghazwani, uh, we recently proved that uh, full measure set of foliations in genus two, with two more saddles are geometrically rigid. So again, when you can linearize them, when you can change coordinates with the homeo to make them straight lines, uh, then it's actually, you can do it in a differentiable way. And I wanted to mention this result also because it's based on renormalization, but somehow renormalization here is not often recurrent. So you can study renormalization and prove that sometimes there is a dichotomy. It can either be recurrent or divergent, but divergent in a special way. 
And when it's recurrent, we can prove uh, uh, linear uh, C1 linearizable. And when it diverges, we can actually prove that you could not be linearizable to start with. So somehow the message was, uh, um, there is exciting work going on on understanding flows on surfaces and foliations, and the renormalization is again a key tool. And even when you're not renormalizable, renormalization can be an important tool to study. Okay, so just a summary. We saw slowly chaotic system. The butterfly effect is slow. There are many examples that come from physics, like the RFS model, the RFS billiard, and the flows on surfaces, which also come from the Novikov model of electrons in the metal. And lots of open questions, no general theory, but one can try to understand typical properties of classes of parabolic systems, identify key mechanisms which explain these um, features, like we saw shearing or rotten property, uh, and uh, when you study perturbations, sometimes you can find the order in the zoo. So you can find some common features emerging when you put that. And I think I will stop here. And uh, no, ah, I'm a little bit ahead of time, actually. OK, but I will still uh, stop here. And I'm happy to take questions later. But, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Corinna, for the very nice talk. If there is any questions from the people assisting from the YouTube uh, channel, they can write it uh, in the chat. Uh, so we have a question concerning the last result presented. What do you mean by linearizable ingenuous G greater than one? Conjugate very, good, very good question. Yes, you want to say what are the linear models, and indeed uh, it was not. Uh, it was a side part of my talk, so I didn't. So actually, you can take it. Yeah, close. On, you can. I like to say also, uh, trans if you know what a translation surface is, if you have a translation surface, you can have really linear flow on a translation surface or basically, yeah, like that set of an abelian differential of, yeah, um, closed one form is also fine as a good model. So yeah, I like translation surfaces because then you can really talk about the straight lines and it's really the analogous picture of the flat torus. So I don't have the picture here. And again, I think I'm not sharing everything. I'm only sharing my, uh, yeah. Okay, you can have, for example, a regular octagon and the glue opposite sides, and you get a surface of genus two, which has also a flat metric with singularities at the vertices, but let's ignore it. And on a regular octagon, inside a regular octagon, you can look at straight lines. And when you glue your surface, the straight lines will become uh, uh, the orbits of the linear uh, of a, or the linear foliation, which I want to take. Uh, uh, okay. You should take a, sorry, a decagon. You should take to have two simple sets. But okay, for example, if you take polygons with the uh, um, opposite side identified, and then you have uh, Euclidean distance and uh, you can talk about straight line and this is the type of linear model that uh, we are considering does this answer your question yeah. yeah there is another question is there a relation between shearing and renor renormalization uh, okay so not directly so the, 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 the picture is the uh, goes like this um, I don't know if it makes sense to go to something where there is some shearing. Maybe let me go to, okay, it doesn't matter. A picture, okay, maybe that's good enough where there is some shearing. So in reality, um, okay, so you want to prove properties like mixing or further properties. You want to have uh, quantitative information about the shearing. And uh, um, this you do not get directly from renormalization. So, and also, uh, what do you do in general? You actually, and 
as I said, the shearing depends on the time change. It depends uh, strictly by how fast or slow you move on the trajectories. So usually you don't renormalize the flow, this, uh, the locally Hamiltonian flow, but you just look at uh, a flow with the same orbit, actually a uh, translation flow, okay. Uh, you use renormalization to study some properties about uh, uh, the flow on the surface, and especially to put kind of diophantine type properties. So not all flows in genus two or a certain type will have uh, uh, mixing or Rattner property, only a full measure set. And to describe which ones do and which ones don't, you put conditions and these conditions you study them using uh, renormalization. So renormalization will allow you to prove that uh, uh, almost every or yeah, a full measure set of flows are good for you when you want to prove a shearing. And then you have to use uh, the actual nature of uh, the time change of the movement on the leaves together with the information which comes from uh, renormalization. So not directly, it's used as a tool, but it's a two-step process. So, and then I see a question in the chat. Is there a precise statement in terms of renormalization to justify the names partially parabolic, non-uniform? Uh, no. <laughs> so there's no, first of all, no, there's no precise statement. And first of all, it's, but I can tell you some heuristic. And um, in this case, it's not so much about renormalization, but it is more about uh, shearing, if you want. So maybe I will go to the uh, slide. So first of all, not all uh, parabolic systems are renormalizable. So no, I cannot define it in terms of renormalization, but it has to do with shearing in this case and with the slow butterfly effect. Uh, oh, sorry, so let me click ahead. Uh, I'll try to find the slide with the three examples. Let me go to it. Okay, here we go. Okay, so in all of these three uh, systems, okay, um, well, uh, when you can prove, uh, okay, so for example, for the horror cycle flow, you will see this uh, shearing phenomenon, and the shearing is uniform. So uniformly parabolic has to do with the uniformity of the shearing. So you shear, and even if you don't have a, really the whole cycle flow, but a time change, the shearing will be kind of uniformly bounded above and below. So you will shear at least a bit and not too much. There will be some upper and lower bounds on the shearing. On the other hand, if you go to a flow on surface where you can prove mixing, because of these settles, sometimes, the shearing becomes uh, very strong. So actually there are points which shear a lot. So shearing is kind of unbounded. There are parts of space where the shearing is arbitrarily large. So non-uniformly parabolic refers to that. And partially parabolic refers to the fact that your phase space, you have some uh, invariant submanifold where maybe you do not have shearing. So you actually have elliptic. So you have isometric behavior. And this is exactly what happens in the Heisenberg flow. You have a torus inside a three-dimensional Heisenberg manifold. And on this torus, you see a rotation. So it's an isometry. And there you don't have shearing, but in other directions, you have shearing. So it's partially parabolic in the sense that shearing only happens on part of space. And when you do a time change, you actually can break this uh, invariant torus where you have isometry and you can create uh, uh, shearing in all space. Uh, it's a bit vague, but I hope it, uh, it answers your question. And thanks for giving me the chance to explain that. So I'm happy that you asked it, yeah. But it's not formal. It's more of a, a philosophy, but the idea is what I explained that it's kind of similar to the idea of uh, uniform, non-uniform, or partially hyperbolic. Dynamical system. But there's a lot to explore. We just understand a few examples. So it's not a, a formal definition or a formal theory. Yeah. Okay. If there are no other questions, uh, we can thanks. Uh, Corinna for this very nice talk again and uh, 
Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for the questions and for the organization and for listening. Yeah. Thanks.